The pleasure is ours. I'm sure we will see you again. All right. So our final speaker is a great friend of Singularity University. He is a, an entrepreneur. He is a hacker, a futurist, an inventor. He's worked with folks like Nathan Mirabold at Interle uh, Internet Intellectual Ventures um, and always just brings a, a great energy, great insight to, to our program here. So it's a great pleasure to get to welcome the founder and CEO of Composites, his latest company. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Pablo's Holman. Wow. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Um, I have so much I want to share. I was listening to the panel with that last question talk about kind of like struggle through the answer to whether are we optimistic? Are we pessimistic? And I wanted to kind of present with you guys what I think about. I think of myself as a possibilist. And that just means... It's not inevitable that things could get better or worse, but that it's possible they could get better or worse. So we're going to go through a, a little bit of my perspective on these things we've been talking about all week. Anybody here ever write computer programs? <laughs> um, so coding, you know, with, on a computer is like, you know, delightfully frustrating. You can like you know, take an idea and break it down into logical steps and try to communicate to the computer what it is that you want it to do. And, you know, what happens is you get like a zero or a one in the wrong place. And then the press, the computer just like mercilessly rejects you with error messages. And then there's a lot of head banging and hair tearing and this kind of stuff until you realize exactly where you were being ambiguous. And then when you can convey to the computer in a logical progression, it rewards you by doing exactly what you wanted it to do in the first place. That can feel euphoric. And if you can stand to listen, a programmer will tell you exactly what his code is doing because it's logical. Machine learning is totally different. It gives us a way to have computers take on puzzles of unfathomable complexity. Now, these puzzles don't make any sense to us to solve in a logical progression. We don't even really know what the rules are. We don't understand how to solve them. But with machine learning algorithms, they can find the solutions for us. We don't know how to do it, but they can. But for machine learning to help us, these algorithms need to learn what we care about. What does solved mean to us? Do we want the machine to win at all costs, or do we want it to take some of those costs into account? Computers have long been able to help us do what we already know how to do, just a little faster. But now they can do what we don't know how to do. Humans are pretty crummy decision makers. Um, we're almost always optimizing for short-term objectives. Um, you know, we evolved like some amazing ability to make these fast decisions when it's necessary, when it comes to bigger problems, longer time horizons, larger staggering scale problems. Well, we don't perform so well. Almost a million humans die of malaria every year. We're failing to save those lives. And it's not because we don't care. It's because our tools weren't good enough to solve those problems. Our tools, like guesswork and superstition. Um, this is like a big, complex game, and we've been losing. But now we can use the same toolkit as Alpha Zero to win this game, to save a million lives a year. This is the untapped potential that's in that AI toolkit we're beating you over the head with, <laughs> right? It helps us make better decisions, and it's enough. This technology is enough to keep us busy for the rest of our lives, and that's why we're, so, we're trying to grapple with it now. We're in a new renaissance 
new extraordinary tools to help humans create our own future. George Dyson told me this story about when he was three years old. Um, he's like walking home with his dad, Freeman Dyson, the physicist. And they found this like fan belt lying on the side of the road. And George asked his dad what it was. And Freeman said, it's a piece of the sun. Freeman was a protege of this of Hans Bet, so he won a Nobel Prize for discovering the carbon cycle that fuels the stars. And when he was accepting his speech, in his acceptance speech, accepting the Nobel Prize, he said, stars have a life cycle much like animals. They get born, they grow, they go through a definite internal development, and finally they die to give back the material for which they're made so the new stars may live. To an engineer, fan belts exist between the crankshaft and the water pump. To a physicist, fan belts exist briefly in the intervals between the stars. That's how George described it. So do we. We live in a long-term evolution. The cells in your body Energy is expended to give them life, and they live briefly. They serve whatever purpose they can for the greater organism before dying. You and I, we're made of energy. It's what creates our life, and we serve whatever purpose we can for the greater organism before dying. Maybe that purpose is your family, your community. Maybe it's all of human civilization. Maybe there is a point to all this. Maybe not. If there is no point, you can just have an iPhone app deliver weed to your dorm room with a drone <laughs> and eat bonbons until you're dead. That'll be fine. Um, if there is a point, well, then we've got to guess what it is. We aren't all going to make the same guess. So in the meantime, most of us are trying to do the best job we can making the world better for humans. Even the humans with different guesses about what the point is. And accomplishing this certainly means doing the best job we can taking care of the world that we all share. So in one form or another, humans have been up to this since the beginning. Sometimes the going is tough and you just have to provide for your family. Sometimes the going is really tough and you end up competing with other humans for the same resources, and that can get pretty ugly. Sometimes humans face serious existential threats on an individual scale, like tigers, or even on the scale of a civilization, like smallpox. 400 million people died of smallpox before we invented vaccination. Even world wars are benign by comparison. Some humans are lucky, lucky enough to stand on the shoulders of all that have come before them and to add to the corpus of knowledge to discover something new about how the world works. The scientists. Some humans are clever enough to put that discovery to use, the inventors. In that moment, humans evolve beyond our biology. We evolve with our minds. and We acquire a new tool, a force multiplier, greater potential. Some humans get to ask themselves, if this New tool changes anything humans have ever done. Can we do it better? Can we do it faster, cheaper, more efficiently, in a more humane fashion? Well, those are the entrepreneurs, technology entrepreneurs. When they succeed, the destiny of the whole world takes another step forward together. Kinesis. After that, everyone else takes over. Nurses, teachers, CEOs, cooks, 
truck drivers, Uber drivers. Hopefully you know at least one of each of those. Um, these are the operators. We all contribute in some way to this process. We get to argue about which role is more important, but the truth is we need them all. The people in this room are these people and more. We are scientists, inventors, entrepreneurs, and operators. We are the people who will drive these ideas from conception through their entire life cycle. We create the experiments to figure out which ideas are the best. And we're the people with the greatest ability to steer them. And that's why our work is so important. Why we have such a tremendous responsibility. Here are some of our greatest hits. Vaccines, steam engines, internal combustion engines, flight, really long flights, <laughs> telephones, radios. This is a transistor that I cut in half with an ion beam, and a scanning electron microscope, probably more important than all those other things. Notice how all those things I showed you are from like the last hundred years? Humanity's on a roll, or have we peaked out? Well, we've got CRISPR, cryptography, cold fusion coming, hopefully, fast neutron fusion reactor, fission reactors. There's more to come. In all of human history, we are the humans most endowed with the most knowledge, the most experience, the most energy, the most wealth, the most superpowers, and the most responsibility. Right? All these technologies are tools for us to exact our values into the world. So we better get clear on what we want to accomplish. Do we need our stuff delivered by drones? Do we need more dystopian, cautionary tales about how robots are going to turn us all into gray goo or paper clips? Do we need all this crap streamed to us in 4K in our palms? Do we need more subscriptions on our credit card? I mean, I think we could do better than that. What if it was the same amount of work to make an iPhone app? to diagnose malaria or cancer as it is to make an app to share selfies? What if it was the same amount of work to eradicate a disease as to build a scooter rental company? What if, if, what if we could make a pair of jeans with less than 940 gallons of fresh water being polluted? What if we could give every human on Earth as much energy as we give an American, but carbon free? What if we could make education as compelling as video games? Or 3D print things that people actually want to buy from industrial waste materials? What if we could turn garbage into an energy source? What if we could reverse the damaging effects of global warming? What if we could stop driving hundreds of species to extinction every day? What if we could lift another half billion people out of extreme poverty? The last half billion. None of these things are inevitable, but they are all possible. And some of them will happen in our lifetime. These are some of the extraordinary opportunities in technology, our contribution to humanity's long evolution. Where I grew up in Alaska, uh, we had less people than in Siberia, but the same weather. Um, so I got this Apple II in 1960 or 79. Sorry, thing had less RAM than a Diet Coke, but it lit up my imagination. You know. Nobody around me knew any more about computers than I did. Probably the closest computer expert was in Siberia. Imagine trying to talk to like a motorcycle gang about 
you know, cryptocurrency and CRISPR. I mean, that's what my life was like. It was an understatement to say there was no tech community. I had to read magazines at the library to find out what was happening in Silicon Valley. Eventually, I finagled my way onto ARPANET, um, got my first taste of joining a community that could appreciate the potential for these technologies. The Silicon Valley of the 80s, 90s was an extraordinary place. It, was, it felt like everyone was in on the secret. We knew these computers gave us superpowers. We were all trying to come up with ideas for how to put them to use. The most important thing was you could have these kinds of conversations with anyone. No matter how crazy your idea was, you'd get the benefit of the doubt. Everyone would try to help you make it better. Now, Silicon Valley has been eroded by opportunists, here for the gold rush. They're playing a different game, using all these technologies to ex play Monopoly for grown-ups, right? That's why we're here, at this summit. This is our Silicon Valley. This community is where you can have these meaningful conversations about the implications for these technologies and their impacts on the world. Can we? Will we? Should we? When you learn to internalize what all those nonlinear graphs we're beating you over the head with actually mean, to reason your way to your beliefs, to embrace technology as tools, well, then you join a community of people who can meaningfully contribute to the conversation about forging the future. In a lot of communities, people are content to speculate about how everything can go wrong. This is where we can speculate about how everything could go right. What possibilities could there be for humans after we accomplish all those things? This planet certainly isn't eternal. I got to help start Blue Origin uh, for Jeff Bezos. We were trying to figure out how to build spaceships. What if humans could have an enduring presence in space? What if we could set the stage for our descendants to populate the whole universe? What if trillions of human lives, human souls, could thrive? It sounds like almost too much to imagine, but imagination is what humans are uniquely good for. Most people on Earth don't have a lot of choice about what to work on. They have to do whatever they can to keep everybody fed and healthy and safe. Most of us here aren't worried about those kinds of problems anymore. We inherited a pretty wealthy civilization. We became affluent enough to stop worrying about acute existential threats to people around us. We got the chance to level up. We get the chance to work for the humans yet to come. We get the chance to become better ancestors. That's what I had to share with you guys today. Um, I'm going to hang around this afternoon uh, or this evening and hopefully get to chat with some of you guys. And I'd love to hear about what you're working on. Thank you.